the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good, in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing that you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. Well, principle explained, example given, practice carried out, exercise critiqued. Explain, demonstrate, imitate, correct. It's a model of training used all over the world. And no doubt, our national coaches, Gareth Southgate and Eddie Jones, will be exercising the model substantially over this next week. I have indelibly imprinted on my mind an activity I was involved in that was recorded and then replayed in front of 150 of my colleagues many, many years ago now, in which I had made a real schoolboy error that would, in real life, have cost a number of people their lives. And I learned a lot from it. I hope they did too. Today we have a classic example of this. And today we have John explain, he's already explained the gospel to Gaius, he's lived it out before Gaius, and now he commends Gaius and critiques Diotrephes. And you can see verse 11 that his intention is that we see this letter with its two examples as something to follow or not. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. The letter is an absolute gem. It's written from the great apostle John to Gaius. It's a personal letter, intensely so, and it's the shortest of its sort in the New Testament. We've no idea who Gaius was. It was one of the most common names in the first century. There are three potential candidates in the New Testament, but it could easily be any other individual. John is the apostle, and we looked last week at, as to why John is rightly understood to be the author both of the Gospel and 1, 2, and 3 John. Multiple times we've said that our exercise here on Sunday mornings in this congregation has been to look at all of the writings of John this year, and here is his third letter. We've been considering the book of Revelation at our weekends away. But you can see verse 11, beloved, do not imitate evil, 
but imitate good. Explain, demonstrate, imitate, correct. The verb is singular, beloved, my dear friend, dearly beloved, my most precious Gaius. And in this brief letter, we have these two examples, substantial portraits, one of evil and the other of good. First, Gaius, the man who loved the truth. Secondly, Diotrephes, the man who loved himself. The man who loved the truth. We can see from the first verses that the familiar themes of truth and love find themselves expressed tangibly in the life of Gaius. Twice we're told that the people who visited the church Gaius attended could testify both to his truth and to his love. Verse 3, I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Verse 6, they testify to your love before the church. You can't bear witness to something you haven't seen. And so Gaius' love for truth and truth expressed in love are on display. And these Christian visitors have returned to John the Apostle, testifying to them. Three times we see John speak of truth, Gaius whom I love in truth, probably in the truth. The brother of I, brothers testified to your truth, you are walking in the truth. So clearly Gaius is standing firm, and John's aim is to commend him and his example of Christian truth worked out in love. To John, truth really matters. And to John the Apostle, theological truth is not disconnected from everyday life. If we believe the wrong things about God, we will live the wrong way before God. What we believe works out in what we do. There's no gap between doctrine and action. Action always flows out from ideas. And because the truth of the gospel has been implanted in Gaius and those like him, and the truth of the gospel as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ is of self-sacrificial love for the whole world, so with this love now implanted within Gaius, the truth cannot but work itself out in love. If we believe God is good and that we're answerable to God, well, we will seek to do good. If we believe God is kind and we're answerable to God, we will seek to be kind. If we believe God is merciful and that we're answerable to God, we will seek to exercise mercy. mercy. And if we believe that there is a God above and that the God above is love divine that the very essence of his character is selfless, sacrificial love, then we will be impacted by that indwelling truth and we will act in love. To the Apostle John, action always flows out from ideas. You know, some of you gardeners, how it is that some plants are impacted by the type of soil and the minerals available to them. I am told, in fact, I know that the hydrangea is one such. Aluminium in the soil is either aided or impeded by the acidity of the soil. Get the wrong kind of acidity and you get the wrong kind of color. As we are fed on the truth of God who loves us, universally and everlastingly and unconditionally, so love becomes the hallmark of the child of God, indwelt by his selfless love. By their fruits you shall know them, says Jesus. Incidentally, there's a recent article which you might find interesting by Tom Holland, where he argues convincingly that humanism, with the values of humanism that they uphold, human rights, justice, the worth of every individual, could only have grown out of the soil of a Christianized Europe. He reflects on Nietzsche's fears that with the determination of secular man to put God to death, eventually all those values will be gone. Certainly that happened in 20th century Germany. The essay is called, essay is called Humanism is Heresy, if you want to follow it up. 
And we can see that Gaius' true truth is worked out in true love as he welcomes these stranger brothers who've come to the church of which he's a part and given them support and encouragement. Here is a man of truth whose truth is worked out in love, but there's more to it than that. Here is a man of true love whose love makes him devoted to the truth. I think this is one of the primary reasons why John is writing this letter. And you can see it spelled out in verses 5 through 8. Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these so that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Now, the brothers mentioned in verse 5 appear to be the brothers who came to the church of which Gaius was a part. They appear to be strangers to Gaius and to the church. Nonetheless, Gaius, and I take it Mrs. Gaius and the rest of the family, exerted themselves to provide for the brothers. Why? Well, it looks like they not only accommodated them, but also provided for them as they went on their way. And these verses spell out the reason. They're clearly Christian teachers. They've gone out from John. This is not the same group who went out from the church in false teaching that you read of in 1 and 2 John. No, they've gone out from the apostle and they've gone out for the sake of the name. And as they've gone out, quite rightly, well, they don't accept gifts from the non-Christian people to whom they go. This was standard principle in the first century church. Their aim is to present the gospel free of charge, to demonstrate that God's grace comes without a price. And clearly they come from John and spend time with Gaius and are then sent out by Gaius, having been supported by him, onward in their missionary journey. Now look at verse 8. Therefore we ought to support people like these so that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Truth produces love. Love is concerned for truth. And so here is Gaius, clearly a man of some means, so committed to the truth, exercised in love, that he cannot but support these early missionaries and send them on their way. How does the truth work itself out in love? What does it look like for a man or woman of true truth truly to love? What action does a person take if they're impacted by the truth that God has revealed to us in the Lord Jesus? Well, because Jesus is the God of love and his love is universal and is a message for the whole world, then the man or woman of truth exercising true love cannot but back the advance of the truth. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And it gives us something of a sense of how the gospel advanced in first century Europe. Remember, there was no Lenny Henry and Premier Inn in those days. And so these missionaries were reliant upon lovers of the truth to receive them, back them, support them, and send them on their way. And so through 1, 2, and 3 John, we have a number of examples of what the truth looks like as it lands in a community of believers. Uh, 1 John 3, 16 and 17, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need, yet closes their heart against them, how does God's love abide in them? Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. 2 John 10, do not receive those who reject the truth. Don't let them into the church. Don't let their voice be heard in the church. It's not a loving thing to do if the truth is love and love works itself out in truth. Then you'll be concerned for the truth if you're a person of love. And now 3 John verses 5 through 8, if you're a person of truth, why you will back the advance of the truth. May I say that for many years we have benefited as have our families here at St. Helens from being part of a community of those who love the truth, where truth is worked out in love. The benefits are extraordinary, 
And you, if you've been part of the community here, will be able to witness to them. Accommodation provided, food provided, loving support provided, care provided for one person or another in medical, financial, or whatever need. And it is a glorious thing to be part of such a community. In some ways, in a rather impersonalized and hostile city like London, the benefits of it are exaggerated in a church like this. But our experience of this truth worked out in love, being propagated across the globe, means also that we have found ourselves beneficiaries of being part of an international community that is committed to the advance of the gospel truth through the speaking of the gospel. And I'm not going to name them all. I'm bound to miss out some of them. But friends in the United States and in Sydney and in Nairobi and in Cape Town, in Nigeria, in Zimbabwe, in Paris, Belgium, China, Latvia, Greece, all over the world, people who are committed to the advance of the gospel truth who've come in amongst us, whom we've been able to welcome, and who we, we hopefully have sent on their way, and from whom we have benefit, benefited beyond measure. It is such a joy to be part of a gospel, a, a, a community that is impacted by the truth of the gospel. Oh yeah, we get things wrong for sure, but what a joy it is to be part of such a community. And for me, The lessons of 1, 2, and 3, John, I think, have most deeply impacted in this area, truth and love. Distance yourself from the truth. Love is removed. Look at communities where the truth of the gospel has not impacted. But verse 8 also contains the greatest of incentives, doesn't it? Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers, I think for a moment of our dear mission partners scattered across the globe, as we support them, courageous as so many of them are, putting their life on the line as some of them do, you and I, we become fellow workers in this everlasting family of love and truth. Now, don't you love it that it's so practical? The great 20th century Bible teacher John Stott puts it like this. An important principle lies buried in verse 8, namely that Christians should finance Christian enterprises which the world will not or should not be asked to support. Indeed, Christians have an obligation to do so. Verse 8, therefore we ought to support people like these. There are many good causes which Christians may support, but they must support their brethren to whom the world should not be asked to contribute. This is a good guiding principle in Christian giving. I commend it to us. But it's not just money, is it? We think of our mission partners as we meet to pray for them tomorrow evening. That's support. The 10 o'clock congregation have got two huge Uh, two or three huge Christmas cards that they're sending to their specific mission partners, isolated as they are around the world, signed by, you know, 80 people. It's absolutely lovely to be sending that out. It could be texts or emails, a telephone call, whatever, a Zoom call. Gaius, the man who loved the truth, true truth worked out in love, true love concerned for truth. But this precious gem of a letter contains not only Gaius, but also Diotrephes, the type and the antitype. And here we find the man who loved himself. Please note that John's description of Diotrephes concludes with verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So what we read in verses 9 and 10 of the man who loved himself are summed up by the words evil and has not seen God. What an epitaph on the tombstone of Diotrephes, the man who loved himself, the man who is evil, the man who'd not seen God. 
I take it Diotrephes was a man of influence in the church, possibly an elder. He clearly had authority in the church to bar people from exercising ministry there. He caused significant damage. He is described in verse 9 both in terms of self-serving ambition and arrogant rejection. Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Now, I suspect one feeds off the other. Self-serving ambition driving arrogant rejection. Self-serving ambition. There doesn't seem to be much evidence that Diotrephes was theologically adrift. Given John's readiness to call out error in 1 and 2 John and to name it very deliberately, it seems that were Diotrephes theologically adrift, John would have pointed it out. He doesn't. It's his ego that is the problem. He appears to have leadership gifts, strong personality, man of influence, but he was a pain in the neck. This isn't unique. Think of James and John in the Gospels. Lord, grant that these will sit one on your right, one on your left hand in the kingdom of heaven. Think of the ugly squabbling of the disciples at the Lord's Supper in Luke 22. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. What was Diotrephes' motive? Well, it is speculation, isn't it? Was he a big man? A somebody? Can be the way he had really achieved something in business. He was recognized locally in the sphere of the town, politics and so forth. He was a big hitter. And he wanted to throw his weight around equally in the church. Was he a little man? A nobody? Do you know, the local church, because we're so kind to people, can sometimes be the final strutting ground for a man or woman whose work colleagues and golf club committee members have long since dispatched. But his epitaph is damning, and it stood for over 2,000 years. Personal ambition is so ugly, surfaces so eagerly and easily in church leadership, is such a plague, is evil, and is the behavior of somebody who has not seen God. Once again, speaking personally here at St. Helens, we should be so grateful for the men and women in the church here who have evidenced godliness in abundance, in a willingness to subjugate personal preference and desire for the service of the church. It's a mark of the gospel. Because if you've seen Jesus, who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, and emptied himself into the form and likeness of a human being. If you've seen Jesus, then emptying self is what dwells within. And all around us, our fellow Bible teachers, senior men and women in the world, gifted, skilled in leadership, godly, intelligent, so so embodied by the gospel, that they don't put self first. What a blessing. And how easily that can be disrupted. More than one church I can think of and have pondered this week have been all but destroyed by diotrophases. And of course, with the advent of social media, it's possible for such voices to be amplified and multiplied. And this personal ambition of Diotrephes works itself out in an arrogant rejection of the apostle. Again, we're not quite sure what feeds this. Is it theological? Maybe, but I wonder. Could it be that Diotrephes is so full of himself that he seeks to denigrate the apostle, not on the basis of the apostle's teaching, but because Diotrephes wants to be top dog, and he doesn't want the apostle coming and squashing him? We can see how it works itself out in verse 8, 9, and 10. Verse 9, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes doesn't acknowledge our authority. If I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. 
Not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, stops those who want to, and puts them out of the church. It seems that John has written to the church, but Diotrephes won't have any of it. He won't let the letter be read out. Those who brought the letter, he won't let them into the church. And he goes so far as to excommunicate those who seek to back the apostle. He speaks what's untrue. He spreads rumor. He passes on salacious gossip. He even initiates it. He's part of that group that delight in character assassination rather than the proper process of careful evidential examination. The New English translation, bringing unjustified charges against us with evil words. And it seems that he does this because he likes to put himself first. Notice that the apostle is prepared to call this out. It takes no little courage to do that. If I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And then verse 10 provides an example of how his overinflated ego works itself out. He refuses to welcome the brothers. He stops those who want to and excommunicates them. This is really ugly stuff. Should we consider isolationism in a church leader as an early symptom of inflated ego? The church leader that cuts himself off, so precious about the pulpit that he's the only one. One writer says this, here is a standing warning against confusing personal ambition with zeal for the cause of the gospel. So easy, isn't it, to put zeal for the gospel as a cloak over vanity. Personal vanity still lies at the root of most dissensions in every local church today. John Stott. Well, we must draw a line there, I think. Demetrius is a peach. I think he's just wonderful, verse 12, but we're not really told much about him except that everybody speaks well of him. Here's a model example, and I take it he's bringing the letter and delivering it. But it's worth, in question time, us reflecting on what will it look like for us if we want to remain and our children to grow up in a community of godly love. What does it actually take? It takes considerable courage. 2 John 10, do not receive them. You have to be able to spot and bar false teachers from the community because they do not bring the gospel of truth and of love. Once that's gone from the church, love has gone. It takes considerable cost from us as we embrace the truth We ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. And it takes a degree of self-examination that we look at ourselves because Diotrephes lurks in every single one of us. Let me lead us in prayer. We thank you our Father in heaven, that you are love and that your love manifested itself amongst us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who made himself nothing and went as far as a sacrificial death on the cross for those who hate him. Please embed in us such truth and such love. Please enable us to support the advance of this truth, to guard it courageously. And Lord, we are sorry, we cannot, every one of us, but be sorry for our own ego. We ask that you would help us as we consider your love to repent of it and seek to live lives of service. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. First, a clarification question someone's put in. Just verse 11, doing good. Could you help us just be clear on what that's meaning? Well, I think in the light of the letter, I'd want to say first and foremost, it's in the good that has been witnessed in Gaius. So, I mean, you could extend it right out, but I think because of the place of truth, you're going to want to define what doing good is by the truth of the Christian gospel that the Apostle John has taught. So if you want to initially confine it to 3 John, perhaps then expand it into 1 and 2 John, and then you might like to go into the rest of the New Testament. Thank you. Thank you. A few on diatrophies. Um, a question here around they clearly... He's somebody who seems to know the truth or at least appear theologically sound. How do we understand those who appear to know and love truth but act like Diotrephes? Do they actually know truth? Well, I think verse 11 is very instructive. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Now, having said that, you know, all of us um, are fallen and fail. And so, you know, I think we can all of us, I expect, look back on our past and think, wow, I acted out of selfish motive at that point, and I shouldn't have done. And doesn't, I think 1 John gives us such a wonderful place to go with that. If we say we have no sin, we're liars. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I take it that every one of us will be in 1 John verses 8 and 9 as we consider diatrophies. And, uh, you know, sometimes such an act can be very public. Uh, and I, I expect we've seen that sort of thing in even recent history. Uh, very public, putting yourself first and so forth. But I don't think I'd want to write somebody off, you know, <laughs> because of just one incident like that. The gospel surely always is coming to us. That is the truth. And saying, look, turn back, turn back, turn back, you know. So things we will have done when we're young and so forth. I, I mean, I don't know about you, but well, I, well, not you, but I don't know about some of you old, some of some of the old goats like me. Well, sorry, I'm the old goat. Some old people like me. You know, you, you know, you look back and you think, did I really say that? Did I do that? I can't believe I acted like that. And the older you get, the more it happens. Um, and going to one John one eight and nine, I think, is key. Otherwise, we become totally bound in on ourselves with guilt. Yeah. Some practical question here. William, as a man with clear authority in this church and nationally, what steps do you take personally to try and watch against the dangers of diatrophies? <laughs> thank you. For, well, thank you for that. Well, or maybe, what might we think about practically? Look, yeah. I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards if you want to come and suggest a few things to yeah. I think it's really, really important that one is open to critique and open to um, uh, you know, other people. And we have quite a lot of that um, within the team here, to have people close to you who are able to say, I mean, those of us who are married, you know, our, our wives are very helpful in these matters. Um, but having people close to you, I mean, formally, because of our relationship with the Church of England, I actually have a kind of full 360 degree review and all that sort of stuff. But, I mean, those sort of things, you can so easily pull the wool over people's eyes and so forth. So I think you do need to have good friends who are prepared to say, look, you are out of order at that point. And that's really important. Yeah. Um, and not be precious about it. You know, we're all fallen. We all make mistakes. And if you're in a community of truth and love, then truth and love um, should, be, should abound. Thank you, William. Um, Someone asked here, thinking of Philippians 1, where Paul rejoices that the gospel is preached, even out of selfish ambition. How does that square with what we see here with Dr. Oh, Are there different you. things, perhaps? Thank you for that helpful <laughs> comment. Um, I, who knows? I mean, has Diotrephes gone too far? It, it, is, you know, is the, we don't know the precise situation of Philippians 1, um, but... What appears to be happening here is Diotrephes is actually banning and barring the apostolic teaching from a church where he appears to have had significant impact. Um, so I think, you know, and he's going to call him out, and who knows what will happen. Yeah. So I think maybe it's a question of degree. Thank you. 
Um, somebody asked here about, um, from particularly in 1 John, we've used the language of the departed and the world mm. quite interchangeably. Um, is, is, when we're talking about the departed, are we talking about a particular group who are rejecting the apostolic gospel? Are they different from the world? Yeah, it's really interesting in 2 John. I'm, you know, you're the expert on 1 John, uh, Phil, but uh, in 2 John, it's really interesting that he talks about them. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. So there seems to be a tug from the world, that is, this world set against the teaching of Jesus. There is a pull factor into the world that will attract false teachers because they want to be friends with the world. And I think we see that in the contemporary church scene. And you look at it down through history, you want your place at the high table. You want to be part of the establishment. It's almost most dangerous in an established church like the Church of England because you, 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 know, you want to be. Um, but the world set against Christ will draw all the time both believers and, belie- and uh, both, both uh, uh, church members and church leaders and The departed in 1 and 2 John appear to be those who have been drawn by the world away from gospel truth and are now embracing uh, the teaching and the ethics of the world. Now, that's very, very contemporary indeed. And Paul, the, the fascinating thing about 2 John, and I hope many of us were away last weekend, so do get the 2 John talk. The fascinating thing about 2 John is that truth feeds love. And therefore, the loving thing to do, it's counterintuitive, but the loving thing to do when one embraces teachers who've gone out into the world away from the teaching of the apostle is actually, to John 10, not to receive them, to protect the church from their teaching. Uh, And we have to work out what that looks like in practice, but... Um, does that begin to... I think that's very helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Phil, what you, what are you, you're the one John expert. <laughs> yes, the one John learner. Um, I think um, I think that the depart in the world in one John is sort of his shock factor in chapter two, that there are the departed. They've gone out away from the apostolic teaching and they are, if you like, in some sense claiming to have progressed beyond... Mm. And John, if you like, unmasks them and says, this group who've gone out, don't be deceived. They're just the world. They're the same. And so actually the language is used interchangeably because that's the, and that's the help for us is not to be deceived, but to mm. see, see it for what it really is. That's right. Last week in 2 John 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And we saw that progressives are regressive. If you, if you depart from the truth once revealed in its totality in Christ, then actually we're regressing from God. Super. There's a few more questions. There's, there's one, I'm really sorry, I half read it and accidentally deleted it, but I think it was kind of asking around um, what if, if someone is persisting in unrepentant sin um, what, what do we do there? And I think one of the great calls and encouragements from 1 John is we are encouraging people to look again to the Lord Jesus and his love for us, the propitiation, strikingly mentioned twice in that letter, and admit that sin. There is safety to confess sin at, at the cross. And so that's our encouragement there. Um, perhaps one to finish on here. How do we speak out... Um, in light of those who appear to be against the truth without ourselves being uh, heard to be unloving or uh, behaving in unloving ways. Yeah, well, you, I mean, it's very striking, isn't it, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, first take the speck out of your own, own uh, the plank, sorry, the plank, the roof beam, one of these things, out of your own eye. It, both in 2 John and 3 John, I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and we'll talk face to face. And that's beautiful. You get exactly the same thing at the end, the same sentence at the end of two, nearly the same sentence at the end of two, John. So I think the face to face, um, certainly don't you know, put it out publicly. I think Matthew 18 gives us very clear, doesn't it? 
in how we deal, first speak individually, then perhaps go with two, um, then talk to a wider group in the church. So, you know, there is, that's why I spoke in this um, talk that I just gave, that there is proper process in the church. And don't uh, uh, take it into your own hands to become judge. And, and I think in today's world, when there has been proper process followed, you may not agree with that proper process and the results it came to. But what I've noticed is that a lot of people then seem to want to take it out on the individual against whom the proper process has been conducted rather than deal with the proper process. And that, I think, can, I think that's just extremely ugly and unkind uh, for the, the person who's been through the whole proper process. And then those who don't agree with it then mount their own independent inquiry with none of the evidence in front of their noses, which that is the world we live in at the moment. And it's one of the marks of moving away from a Christian heritage, backbiting, insult, slander, becomes the norm, lack of integrity. It's just normal as you move into a non-Christian environment. Having said that, the church has plenty of its own problems.